So we keep pushing forward. I know it's fast, but that's just kind of how this course is, guys. This is um, going to be lecture 17. Page 1, this is going to be for us in our text, the Chango and Bowles text, that's going to be chapter 7. This is, what is this? This is uh, entropy. And the second law. And so we really took a, we really take an in-depth look at entropy in this chapter. In the, the previous chapter, we spent a little time talking about uh, the devices that we have existed for a couple of centuries now, and we wanted to try to maximize the production of those devices. The, the heat engine, the steam engine, or the heat engine, a device that takes heat input in and generates a work output. Uh, and then we talked about the refrigeration system and the refrigeration cycle, a device that basically pumps heat from a low temperature source to a high temperature body, um, which is in the direction that heat does not travel spontaneously, so you have to push it in that direction. And uh, so that's a refrigeration device or a refrigerator. Uh, air conditioner is a type of refrigerator. And then we talked about the heat pump, which is a refrigeration cycle that instead of um, where a refrigerator, the goal of a refrigerator is to cool the low temperature space. The goal of a heat pump is to heat the high temperature space. So it's still a refrigeration cycle. We just repurpose it. So those are those are the three devices we focused on in Chapter Six. And I always like to say that Chapter Six for us is Chapter Six. And there's often chapters like that in many thermodynamics texts I've looked at. There's often a chapter that introduces the second law with ever, without ever actually showing you the second law. And then almost immediately after that, there'll be a chapter on entropy and entropy balance and entropy generation, which is really what the second law is all about. So basically, chapter six was showing us why we understand the second law is true. And chapter seven is where we actually talk about how do you quantify and make sure devices behave according to the second law. So I've shown, I put this up here so you can see it. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you've read through it at this point. Um, entropy is a measure of, for us as engineers, really what we're interested in is how much heat energy can we remove from a system to generate work or mechanical energy that can easily be converted into kinetic or potential energy. Okay. So that's really what we use entropy for, is to measure potential work or potential power that could be extracted from heat. Historically, and if you've had a chemistry course, they probably talked about entropy being a, me a measure of disorder or a measure of chaos. How unpredictable is your system or the molecules and atoms within the system? We knew from experience that when left alone, a, an isolated system would reach its highest possible state of entropy just spontaneously. That's just what it does. And in order to reorganize the system, we would have to add, we would have to do work. So, this knowledge exists. We, we've made this observation for quite a while. We've never in the 1700s or so, we've, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, we've never actually quantified or figured out how do you quantify what's actually going on there. We didn't call it entropy at the time. Um, we just knew this was there was this phenomena that prevented um, perpetual motion machines from existing. But we've got work by people like Clausus. Remember, we had the Clausus statement in Chapter 6, and we also had the Kelvin-Planck statement. So we've got work of many engineers and physicists in this time frame um, trying to figure out why is this the case. Well, Clausus comes to a conclusion about um, a cycle, a cyclic device, where I add heat or remove heat, and if I track that amount of heat divided by the temperature at which that heat occurs, I get a negative quantity. Now again, this is, I call this a cyclic integral. I've, I think line integral is, is often used as 
for us, we're referring to a cyclic integral. This is an integral evaluated across a cycle, so starting at one state, finishing at another. Right? And essentially what Clausus is telling us here is that <clears throat> if I have an engine, right, a heat engine, we saw this in the last chapter, so if I have this heat engine that inside this engine it's operating in a cycle. Now what is it doing? Well, it's absorbing heat from this high temperature source. It's producing a net power output or a net work output. And the heat that can't be turned into work, we've got to get rid of, otherwise this thing blows up. So we've got to reject the remaining energy that couldn't be converted to work from the heat in you have to reject that to a low temperature sink. Right? And this is essentially how a heat engine works. Now, what Klaus is, is saying is if you go around this cycle, let me make sure I'm on the screen. You're going to hear a pop. Okay, roughly on the screen. So, Klaus has comes to the conclusion if I go around this cycle and I sum up everywhere I've got heat coming in divided by temperature and subtract everywhere I've got heat going out divided by temperature that quantity, that integral, adding up every little tiny slice of heat, every little dq, I'm going to get a negative quantity. The more efficient the device is, right, the more of this goes out here, the more efficient, um, the closer this quantity approaches zero. But you can't ever actually get there, even for the most efficient devices that we can construct. So Klaus has comes to um, right, he begins to see kind of this pattern emerge. He starts coming to some conclusions based on this, his work and this information. So the one conclusion is, well, if, if you've got a perfectly reversible, 100% efficient, well, not 100% efficient, but the, the highest efficiency, um, if it's completely reversible, then this sum, if you add up all the heat divided by temperature, you're going to get a zero. And if you don't get zero, that just means it's an irreversible process. So what that means, what that's telling us, is that something's being generated. Now, before I talk about what's being generated, let's talk about, Steve, why is, you're saying this is negative? Why is it, why would you want it to be negative? Why are we calling this negative? Well, that just means there's a sign convention at play here, right? And the sign convention is this. It's, it's kind of a standard traditional sign convention on heat transfer where um, we're saying that heat in, any heat flowing into the system is, is positive. Right? So this is positive heat coming in at a high temperature. And then the other one is heat going out, this guy down here, and we're saying that's negative. So anywhere heat comes into a system, we're going to call that positive. So if I add that up, Right, if I integrate it, everywhere heat's coming in, that's a positive quantity, and everywhere heat's going out, it's a negative quantity. Okay, and so that's the sign convention we use. Now, again, what Clausus comes to the realization is, well, look, if it's irreversible, it means something's being generated. There's this property that I'm essentially measuring. Today, in the modern era, we call this property entropy, or we've identified that it represents entropy. Okay. <coughs> Now, so what we have is, if the process is reversible, this heat divided by temperature is equal to a change in entropy. And what does that mean? Well, I've always got my water here because I, you know, I lose my voice if I don't have some water. And I can increase the, uh, the chaos, the unpredictability of these water molecules. I can do it a few ways. Okay, um, but one simple way to do that is to heat it, right? So if I take a cigarette lighter and I, and I'm not going to do this with a plastic cup, that would be bad. But if I had a metal cup that wouldn't, it was inert and wouldn't catch on fire, I could, I could set uh, a, a lighter or some heat source on this cup and use that to heat the water. And what is that going to do to the entropy, the unpredictability? of those water molecules if I heat them up. 
it's going to make them more chaotic, right? It's going to make them more unpredictable. It's higher entropy. So if I have an increase or if I have positive heat in divided by any temperature, that should create a positive increase or positive change in the entropy. So increase heat, increase entropy. If I remove heat, so it's a negative heat, then I should decrease the entropy. Same thing with this cup of water. If I put it in the refrigerator, what's going to happen to the, the chaos, the unpredictability of the molecules if I cool them down? Well, they're going to slow down, right? They're going to slow down. They're not going to move as, uh, as fast, so they're not going to move as chaotically. <clears throat> they're going to be more predictable, so that's lower entropy. So negative heat, negative entropy. And Klaus's conclusion is this, that... Uh, Again, he's saying, look, if you take the negatives divided by their temperatures and add to them the positives divided by their temperatures, you're going to get a negative quantity. And what that does is it dictates the direction that heat is going to flow, that it can flow. Okay? And it also tells us, again, because it's always a negative quantity, that tells us for the cyclic device, something's being generated somewhere. And that's something, again, we call today entropy. So if you look at that quantity, <coughs> again we said if um, a change in entropy, if it's, if it's reversible, is equal to a, a differential, so a differential change in entropy is equal to a differential amount of heat divided by temperature, and it's an equal sign if it's reversible. If it's not reversible, it's a um, greater than or equal sign. Okay, so basically if I remove the reversible, it looks like this. Okay, <clears throat> so if we look at this, this entropy change is based on a change in energy divided by temperature, meaning entropy has units of energy per unit temperature. And if you look in the property table, they're going to give you little s, right? Little s. So if you've got, I've still got that sheet of notes from the first day. I said, if you got, keep it handy. Yeah. Remember this guy? <laughs> I said, write this, write down the stuff that we're going to use on a regular basis. Keep it to the side. Um, just fair warning. My big S here is total entropy. It looks very similar to my lowercase s. I try to draw my lowercase s's smaller, but this is specific entropy. Right. Little s is just like everything else. It's your extensive property, the big S, divided by mass. It's big S per unit mass. That's my specific entropy. Okay. So specific entropy is entropy per unit mass, meaning that that have, is going to have dimensions of energy per mass per temperature. Or entropy has units of energy per temperature. So the entropy is, is that per unit mass. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so again, Klaus's conclusion is that, and this is, by the way, this is the second law. Congratulations. Been introduced now to the second law. The second law says that a change in entropy is always going to be greater than or equal to what causes the entropy change. Okay. Um, so that entropy, unlike mass and energy, these mass and energy are conserved quantities. They are never created nor destroyed. Um, entropy is not like that. Entropy actually gets generated. At best, in the best case scenario, in the equal to scenario, entropy is being conserved. That's a reversible situation. In all other cases, entropy is being generated. And that's going to be our focus for this lecture today. All right, we'll pick up on the next one.